<clears throat> so what does it mean to uh, to be a veteran in, in these crazy times that we live in? That, that's a question that I'm thinking about and asking veterans all over the country all the time. What does it mean for us to be veterans in these times? And um, when I was a kid, all I wanted was to be John Rambo. <laughs> But the problem was, I looked more like Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> I grew up in a, in a little logging town in Mount Ida, Arkansas. And the town was so small, we didn't even have a stoplight. And one day, this, this, this guy named Mark, uh, a Green Beret, who was home on leave, he, he walked right out of a, of a recruiting poster and into the soda shop where I was sitting. His, I remember his uniform was pressed to perfection. It was like it was like cardboard, and he had these big old shiny boots, these jump boots. And I was a I was a run of a kid, I and mean, pretty severely bullied throughout my life. And and this guy, he was everything I wanted to be. But as cool as he was, and as he looked, it was actually when he sat down with me and he explained to me what special forces really were. That's when I was pinned to the map. Because like in the last 10 years that I've been out of the out of the army, as I travel around, you know, what most people know about the Green Berets um, is a movie with John Wayne by the same title. Uh, the Ballad of the Green Berets. And most recently they've got a would you guys find this? <laughs> Mike, are they coming for you? We're ready. Ruby got things to do. <laughs> And then most recently they've got a, a movie with Green Berets on horseback, but the lead guy is the same guy that plays Thor. <laughs> you know, and, and none of those were really accurate. And, and, and when Mark sat down with me, he said, you know, Scott, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Delta, they're some of the best in the world. They're coming in on target, take that target down, and then they come off the target very, very quickly. He said, but, you know, Green Berets do some of that, but the real specialty of a Green Beret is how they work by, with, and through indigenous people and help them stand up on their own from the inside out. And that really, that really hit me, it really stuck with me. I, I knew right then and there that that was something that I wanted to do, that the, just the nature of, of working with the little guy to help him stand up against the big guy, that resonated with me very, very deeply. And, you know, as I went through a 23-year career, about 18 of that as a Green Beret, I got to serve with these amazing guys like Mike Lacey and I am, I am in, in some of the roughest places on earth, you know? And what I came to see about Green Berets in modern war is they're, they're like a combination of John Wick, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and the Verizon guy. <laughs> or the Sprint guy, or whatever the hell he is these days. In other ways, the, you know, the, the, these relationship-based connectors who happen to be lethal, but only when it's necessary, and, and, and their, their real focus is on that, that rapport and that human connection, and just, it, it never left me, it stayed with me, and I fell in love with it. It was all I ever wanted to do. Um, and in doing that, I was able to work not just with amazing uh, special operators and, and infantry forces, but also a lot of really, really amazing allies across the world, from Colombia to Ecuador, and certainly in Afghanistan. And one of the most impressive groups that I ever worked with was the Afghan commandos. Um, these highly trained, light infantry, Afghan soldiers that, you know, really were fashioned a lot after our army rangers. And one of those guys was a guy named Sergeant First Class Nezamuddin Nizami. But we just called him Nizam. And Nizam was born in northern Afghanistan in 1989. We're not really sure what day. That, that's not that uncommon. Uh, but he was born in Takar province, and it was at the period of time when the, when the Soviet Union was winding down its brutal occupation of that country. Um, and, and they had ravaged that country, much like the Russians are doing in Ukraine today. And Nizam's dad, who was 18 at the time, Nizam, Nizam was around, around four months old, uh, his dad was 18, and he was one of the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters. And um, when Nizam was four months, his dad was killed in a Soviet ambush. And then a few days later, after his dad was killed, the Soviets vectored in on where the patrol 
actually originated from Nizam's village, and they launched some MiG fighters to do bombing and strafing runs on Nizam's village. Now, his mom had just put him down for a nap. And so you can imagine when that 500 pounder was toggled free of that MiG, how little time Nizam's mom and grandfather had as that bomb snaked right in to their house. And they bailed out windows and doors as quick as they could, but Nizam's granddad was blown into the river. He was killed, he was killed immediately. But his mom, somehow she survived. She survived. And, and that 17 year old girl shook off the, the, the explosion and she screamed and she ran back into what was once their house and she started digging through the rubble because she had forgotten the baby. And she's screaming Nizam's name over and over again and neighbors come running over and they're digging through the debris too, trying to help find him. And she finally gets to the point where he would have been sleeping and she pulls it out and he doesn't have a scratch on it. Turns out this little dude's hard to kill. And so at this point, because she had lost her husband, she was not allowed to raise a child on her own as a single mom. She was sold into a forced marriage to a, a guy that was 75 years old at 17. Um, the, the gentleman moved them away, moved her and Nizam away, and uh, he couldn't stand Nizam. The old guy couldn't stand Nizam because he wasn't his biological son. So Nizam slept in the barn with the animals, and one morning he was having breakfast with one relative that he had that was actually kind to him, and he said, Auntie, will I ever have a family? Will I ever have a, a home of my own? And she said, you already do. You, you have a home, you have your backpack. And wherever you go with that backpack, that will be your home. You're a backpack man. And so Nizam took her at her word on that. And at 11 years old, he ran away and lived on the streets of Talaquan, where he worked for his food every day. And that's how he lived his life, homeless, um, on the streets at 11 years old. Several years later, uh, he was down in the uh, village center there and he noticed a bunch of people that were standing around the bazaar, the main part of the bazaar, where the one black and white television was in their village, and, and they were all watching the TV, so he ran over there to see what was going on with the other young kids, and he's standing up on his tiptoes, because he's only about five feet tall, uh, and he noticed that there were these two towers, and they were smoking profusely, and he didn't know what he was looking at, but then one tower fell, and the crowd gasped, and then the other tower fell, and it was even louder. And the Taliban that were standing interspersed with the crowd, they, some of them cheered. But he said, he remember some of them looking kind of nervous and talking amongst themselves in whispers. And a few months, months later, he figured out why that was because there were these NATO soldiers now in his village patrolling around in body armor and slick looking weapons and the Taliban were nowhere to be seen. And then a few weeks after that, the craziest thing happened. There were Afghan soldiers in his village. Now, you have to understand, if you, if you were never in Afghanistan, like they hadn't had uniformed Afghan soldiers, representatives of the people, since like 1978. So this was a serious novelty for them to see this. And they were recruiting. They were recruiting in Taliban, and they were showing a recruiting film, a cheaply made Afghan National Army recruiting film, and Nizam sat in the theater and watched this thing three, three times in a row one afternoon, and then marched promptly into the Afghan National Army recruiting office wearing a pair of women's high heel shoes so he could pass the height requirements. <laughs> the, uh, the recruiter looked at him and saw immediately what he was doing and put him in the Afghan National Army and signed the waiver because he figured anybody that wanted to serve that badly needed to be in. And so he did. And the thing about Nizam is this guy, man, this guy was born for struggle. He had lived struggle his entire life. It was, it was, it was home to him. And he thrived in the army. Within a few months, he had attended the Afghan commando course, and he was part of the, the Afghan commando unit. And then shortly after that, he went through the Afghan National Army Special Forces course which is a very, very unique uh, course that kind of mirrors special forces. And he was the first team to graduate from that. I know because I was the keynote speaker at, at graduation. And then a few months after that, we were conducting operations together for village stability operations. 
down in Afghanistan when Ian was down there as well. He was at this base called Cockrest. And the thing about the thing about Nizam was everybody loved this dude. I mean, everybody loved this guy. He was the kind of guy that would would run operations nonstop. He never took a break. He never sat one out. Um, he walked the point on every operation. Uh, there was so much trust in him within the Special Forces community that they actually sent him back to Fort Bragg to attend the, our, our, our qualification course. Nizam was what a handful of Afghan soldiers that was actually a U.S. certified 18 Bravo weapon sergeant. Uh, he was part of our regiment. And so then he went back to Afghanistan, continued conducting combat operations there. And on one particular evening, um, he was leading a, a small patrol and it was all U.S. guys behind him, and he was on point, and he walked up on a Taliban ambush line, and he realized that he was host, but he also knew he had his U.S. brothers behind him, so he quickly brought his weapon up and fired, and, you know, in doing that, took a 7.62 round through the face, left cheek, and went out the right cheek, and he collapsed to the ground, but the team had enough time to respond, beat back the ambush, they grabbed his arm, pulled him back, and did their best treatment on them that they could, but it was a pretty serious wound, so they put him on a dust-off bird, and they flew him away. Six weeks later, he showed back up out there at the, at the VSO site with a brand new set of American-made dentures and continued conducting combat operations. And he did this all the way up until 2017. Um, he continued to run these operations. I retired in 2013, uh, but you know how it is. We we stayed in touch. We were we were really good friends, and we he would check in on my family, and I would call him a couple of times a month. But I started noticing in 2018 some real changes in the Zom that I that you know they were they were changes that were similar to me. I I had I had retired from the military and uh, had gone through. Pretty crappy transition, if I'm being honest. Like when I got out, I thought I had it pretty much figured out what I wanted to do and how it was going to go. Um, but much like you said, sir, when I came home, the snakes in my head started to crawl pretty badly. Um, I, within, you know, I, I found that that I, I had lost a lot of my purpose. I had lost a lot of my passion. I felt like I had lost my relevance in so many different ways. Uh, I have three boys. And I would walk into a room and my three boys would just get up and walk out of the room because they, um, they didn't know what version of dad they were going to get that day. And it just, it just continued to spiral for me. On the outside, everything looked great. On the outside, everything looked exactly the way it was supposed to. But on the inside, I was, I was falling apart and I was experiencing levels of isolation, uh, fear, anxiety that I had never been through before. Within 18 months, I found myself um, standing in my bedroom closet holding a pistol. I had no intention of coming out. And if my son Cooper hadn't come home that day, for early from school when he did, I wouldn't be here. But he did. And I heard him and I thought, man, what kind of dad lets this kid experience that? So I shamefully put that thing up, walked out of the closet, and was pretty much in this transition purgatory where I was unwilling to live and I was unable to die. And that was just where I was. And I knew, the worst part was, I knew I had something still to do. You know, I was in my early 40s. I felt like I wasn't done yet. I had something to say. I felt like if I could just take the lessons that guys like, Mike and I had taught me these amazing iconic NCOs who knew so much about human connection and about rapport building. If I could take that and, and I looked at my country that was tearing itself apart along every imaginable line, if I could take that and bring that here, there could be some, some real value in that. But every time I would try to tell my story or I would try to talk about those lessons, I would jam up. Either it was the survivor's guilt or the PTS or some nasty devil's cocktail combination and I would just freeze up. I could not communicate my stories in a way that was remotely useful. Um, but I kept trying. I kept looking for folks that maybe could help me do that. And I knew if I could just find that, maybe that could help me pull myself out of it. And I was at this one event 
where they had these different speakers and I was just kind of floating around the country trying to figure it out. And this guy that came up on the stage, he was a, uh, he was a former pro football player named Bo Eason. And he was voted the dirtiest safety in the NFL. They said that this guy hit you, he hit you so hard you smelled smoke. And anyway, he blew his knee out for the seventh time and had become an actor. I know, crazy. And then became a playwright, then wrote his own play about becoming, going from farm boy to NFL player, took it to Broadway, and then became a public speaker. So I'm watching this guy as he's speaking, and he's just, he's like prowling the stage. And the way that he moved, the way that he held the room, no one in the room was looking at anything but him. They couldn't take their eyes off of him. And he seemed to just command the room in a way that I, I had not seen since I was in special operations. And it was that same kind of feeling. It was that same kind of feeling of when, like, Mark walked into that soda shop for me. And I knew right then and there that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do some version of that kind of storytelling. And so I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, I told him my, my quickly kind of my background. And, and he said, I'm going to help you. You know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to work with you. And he did. He trained me for two straight years in the art and science of storytelling. And it it was a process, taking me through the loss and the trauma and the struggles. And he showed me that actually storytelling is a sense-making tool for the brain. It, it heals the brain. It mends the soul. And it is a way to bridge that civil military gap like no other type of communication can do. People locate themselves in your story if you are willing to repurpose your struggles in the service of others. And so I just committed to that. And, I, I, and, and, it, and it did. It started to save me. I started to find myself again. I started to feel my feet on the floor again. I started to kind of feel that spark that I had always carried as a Green Beret. And it started making a difference for me. But more importantly, I start, as I started to talk about my struggles with mental health, for example, I started noticing other veterans were coming up to me and talking to me, other first responders, other family members, Gold Star family members. And they started to locate themselves in my story. And that's when I really started to buy into this thing. So my wife, Monty, and I, we founded a nonprofit called The Hero's Journey, and we started teaching storytelling to veterans. I mean, the real, the, the, the dynamics of it. Um, and I just went to, I became obsessed with it. As many stages as I could get on, TED Talks, getting in front of cameras, writing. I even, to complete my midlife crisis, I wrote a play and learned how to act at age 50. And, and, and all of those things combined to bring that storytelling gift to me. And it became the, the center of my life and the nonprofit work that we do. But the, 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 the toughest storytelling challenge I had in my transition was when uh, in a country that I never thought I'd be involved in again and with a buddy I never thought I'd see again. And it was in Afghanistan when things started to fall apart there. I had... We had performed a play called Last Out that, that, that uh, you heard about, and, and we were doing that. And all of a sudden, things started falling apart in Afghanistan. And, and this was the spring of 2021. And honestly, I had walked away from that world. I was done with that stuff, and I really didn't want any part of it. You know, I mean, I didn't want to be involved in Afghanistan again, and I sure as hell didn't want to be involved with the government anymore. Um, and so it was my friend Nizam who was texting me on Signal. And he was telling me, he was giving me a play-by-play, -play, district by district, province by province, like this thing is, this thing is falling. And I started reaching out to other buddies in seventh group, third group, uh, the SEAL platoons, and I asked them, what are you hearing? And they said, we're hearing the same things. It's not on the news, government's not talking about it, but all, my former interpreter says this thing's a house of cards that's gonna go. And so Nazam told me, he said, I think the whole thing flips in a month, and this was June of 2021. And August 15th, Sunday morning of 2021, I got, a, I got a text from a seventh group buddy, and he said, are you watching the news? And I said, no. He said, turn it on. So I turned the news on, and I'm watching Taliban fighters roll into Kabul on our gun trucks, wearing our kit, carrying our carbines, terrorizing local Afghans on international television. And I'm just standing there with my jaw on the ground and my phone starts blowing up. And probably some of yours did too. And then I got a voice call and it was from Nizam. He never, almost never called voice. It was always 
text, and so I knew something was up. So I answered the phone, and he said, um, sir, it's over. It's over. The president, our president, has left the country. The generals have taken the money. They're gone. All the commando units are disbanded now. They've gone home to their families. They fought to the last round, but there's nothing. He said, I'm in my uncle's house right now, hiding like Anne Frank. And he said, the Taliban are texting my phone. They're circling out here in the cul-de-sac, and my uncle's about to throw me out because he says I'm compromising his family. And I probably am. And then he said this. He said, you know, I never worried about dying in all of this. But I never thought I would die alone. Man, that shit hit me harder than anything else around that whole day was him saying that. And the only thing I could think of was like, okay, I got to keep this guy on the line. You know, I got to keep him. I got to keep him going. So I just said the only thing I could think of. I said, Sergeant, I said, listen to me. All right. You are not going to die alone. In fact, you're not going to die at all. What's going to happen is you're going to get your little ass across Kabul. You're going to get past the Taliban checkpoints. I want you to go to the international airport. You're going to go to Northgate, right? You're going to go to Northgate. Yes, I know you don't have any paperwork, but we're going to work that right now. You're going to go to Northgate. You're going to get uh, you're going to get through that crowd. I need you to get as close to the gate as you can, and then we're going to get you pulled in, right? And then what's going to happen? You're going to get on a C-17 transport. You're coming to the United States, not just anywhere. Come to Riverview, Florida. You're going to be my neighbor, and you're going to work in my nonprofit as a story coach. Are we clear? <clears throat> now, Nizam has this little high-pitched laugh he does when he thinks you're completely BSing him, <laughs> and he gave it to me hard in that moment right there. But but I knew at least I had him back. He was he was dialed in, and I said, "Okay, um, we're going to hang up the phone, charge your phone, pack a bag, be ready to go." So he hung up. And as soon as I hung up, I thought, that's a dead man walking right there. Because I had no idea how in the world we were going to do anything to help this guy. I mean, I've been out of the Army for 10 years, and I'm teaching storytelling. I'm not exactly a top draft pick for hostage rescue. <laughs> but I, you know what I did? I just called a couple of other buddies that I served with in SF. And a couple of guys that were on active duty. One of them's in Congress. Um, an SF guy. And I just talk to him about what was going on with Nizam. And, I, and, and the one thing we all had in common was we had all served with him. We all knew his heart. We all owed him something. And we all had pretty good relationships in that country. So we just started putting together a plan on our phones and on whiteboards in various locations to get him out. And we managed to basically convert our networks that we had built to, to help him move across the city and get him close to the gate. He was about four feet from the gate. Finally, after three days of just staying on the phones and staying up and moving him, he was four feet from the gate, and that's when I got a text from him, and he said, Sir, I'm sorry to tell you this, but the Marines were getting ready to toss me. I, I, they say I, I don't have any paperwork. They've kept me here as long as I can, but they're going to toss me, and uh, <coughs> by the way, my phone's on 10% power. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me, man. Like, to get him this close and be out of, because if we... If, he, if his phone went out of power, that was it. That was his lifeline. He'd already burned his safe house in broad daylight. The Taliban had set up the, the security ring behind him, so there was nowhere for him to go. If he got searched, he's dead. He's dead. The only thing that we had was we had been given a phone number, and I don't even remember who gave it to us, but it was a phone number to a diplomat inside the airfield named JP. That's all we had. Diplomat, JP, Kabul airfield, and then the number. And so that was all we had. So we, you know, we thought, okay, well, theoretically, he could get him pulled in. It is a State Department operation, but we didn't even know the dude's last name. So we called the number, and he picked up. And you could hear the crowd in this guy's phone. You could hear the 50 cal going off. You could hear the flashbangs that the Marines were throwing to try to keep the crowd back. You could hear women moaning and wailing, like through the phone. And he hadn't slept in I don't know how many days, probably seven or eight days. And he said, look. I don't know who you guys are, right? My phone is blowing up. You have one minute. So in that one minute, we started telling him everything we could about the backpack man. We told him about the women's high heel shoes. We told him about being a commando and special forces and going to our special forces course and, 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 and saving an entire patrol of U.S. Green Berets. And we said, brother, look, he is four feet from your Marines right now, man. Like, if you don't pull him in, he is going to be swinging from a lamppost in a few hours. And JP got real quiet. He goes, huh? 
You know, I was a Green Beret before I was a diplomat. So I guess we got to take care of our own. So here's what's going to happen. If the, you don't give him the password right now, the Marines are going to toss him. What's the password? Pineapple. What? Pineapple. Tell him to say pineapple as loud as he can right now, man. So we had Nizam on speaker. So we're like, dude, say pineapple! <laughs> but Nizam's not like that. He's super cool. You know, never likes to make a scene. So there's this, this guy that's kind of right there by, at the gate. Bearded guy, special ops. So Nizam walks up to him. Excuse me, sir. Yo, what's up, man? I'm the pineapple. <laughs> You're the pineapple. I'm the pineapple. Okay, man. Just go through that corridor there. We'll get you on the plane and get you out of here. And so the next thing you know, I get a selfie of Nizam standing in front of like a C-17. And I'm in the driveway. We had company in the driveway at the time talking. And I had completely blown them off because I'm on my phone doing it. And when I saw that, I just collapsed. I just hit the ground, man. You know, and I just, I just started bawling like a baby. And my poor wife, Monty, she comes running up. And, you know, she's been with me through this whole journey for 28 years. She thought something had happened to him. And I was like, no, baby, he's out. He made it. He's safe. And, you know. And I said, we're done, it's over, we can go on. And then all of a sudden, uh, there was, a, you know how you can get those alerts on your phone, there was this zzz, zzz, and I looked down, it was a signal alert, and it was from my buddy Jay, a SEAL, and he said, hey, I heard Nez got out. Congratulations, man. I've got 17 interpreters plus families that are moving to the Kabul airport. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for guys to work with, you wanna work? Zzz, zzz. I looked down again, it's one of my buddies from seventh group. Hey. We got 55 NMRG plus families. We're heading to the airfield. You want to form a room and work? <laughs> Another SF guy for 10th group. Hey, we have 200 Costco Tejas plus families. Like, you got to be kidding me, man. And I look over at my wife and she goes, well, I'll start making supper. <laughs> and I just typed in the chat room. I said, we are now Task Force Pineapple. And so over the next six or seven days, uh, about 120 veterans from a range of services in the intelligence communities, active duty and retired, uh, worked to move between 750 and 1,000 commandos and their families through an open sewage canal, a four foot hole in the fence, and some renegades from the 82nd Airborne uh, that pulled them through and, and got them all to the United States. And you know, for, for me, it was an extremely rewarding thing. It, most of it was just gutting and horrible, and it still is. The fact that we could walk away from our allies like that, and it, it, it had a, a serious toll on our business and our family and all of the things that it, it brought back a lot of the darkness that I had managed to put behind me. And at one point, my wife said to me, she's like, baby, why are you doing this? Why are we getting back involved in this crap again? We spent our whole life doing this. Why are we going back to this? And I just told her, I said, you know, our three boys are watching us right now. Like, they're watching to see what's happening. And, and for us, for the group of guys that I was working with anyway, I mean, there was nobody else coming. That was it. And I just feel like that's the way all of us were wired, you know. That's just how we operate. That was our Pineapple Express. And, uh, but then I go back to just my, my opening question to you all. It's like, what does it mean to be a veteran in these times that we live in? You know, what, is it, what does it mean for us? Because I know that since those towers fell, well, you know, first I'll back up to our sponsors in the room and to the civilians in the room. You know, first of all, thank you. Seriously. Because we can't transition without you. And I, and I hope that you know that. Um, and, and I've long contended that it is time to get beyond thank you for your service. Uh, because our veterans and our military family members, I believe, are, are a national necessity in getting this country back to better days and getting us back to where we need to be as a nation. But we, we cannot do that without civilian sponsors who connect with us, who allow us to tell our stories and hear them without judgment, and then who walk that path of healing with us as we get back in the game and lead. 
whether that was Bo doing that with me or whether that is with the sponsors that have made this event happen for 12 years and then we reunite Battle Buddies. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, those are the kind of things that get us back in the game and leaving here at home. To the, to the war fighters and your families, you know, I know for the post 9-11 guys and girls, like it, it's, it's been a journey. You know, since those towers fell, so many of you ran so many miles. You ran so hard. There's people in this room with more than 10 deployments. You know, um, and the, the impact on our military families, it, it's enormous. And the load that you all have carried so that we could stay in the fight. But really, whether you were Vietnam, Korea, uh, various conflicts during the Cold War or post 9-11, it's tough. You know, it is tough when you look at the economy the way that it is, the job market and the way that it, that it fluctuates and, and, and all of the, the challenges that are out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to pull back. But, but what I would say to you as I, as I close this out is like, you know, do you really think that you ran all those miles, endured all of the hardships that you endured, got scuffed up the way that you did so that you could fade away, right? And just talk about the glory days. That's not who you are. That's not how you're wired. You know, one of the things that I'm so grateful for, just like you, sir, is like I had the opportunity to bear witness to your actions on the battlefield. I've seen you. I've seen what you do. I've witnessed the loyalty and the camaraderie and, and, and the immense problem-solving capability in the face of tremendous adversity. I've watched it firsthand. And our country's in trouble. I mean, let's face it. The country is in trouble. Right? Look at the way that our politicians are treating each other. Did anybody wake up this morning and go, Thank God for Washington, D.C. <laughs> right? Look at the way, look at the state of our schools. Right? Look at the way that our communities are dividing each other along tribal lines. I mean, we actually need veteran and military family leadership more than we have ever needed it at any time in our history. We have to have it. it I believe it is our last option to get this country back to better days. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take the same kind of, of purpose and commitment and storytelling and leadership that you demonstrated in those rough places. But we're going to need it here. Right? Because nobody else is coming. Right? That was our Pineapple Express when our allies were abandoned, but there's a whole lot more of those out there. And, um, and we need you more than ever to do that. And, and, and you're not alone. You're actually not. It may be different battle buddies this time around. It may be civilians at your left and right, along with new veteran groups. But um, we need it more than ever. And we can't let you fade away, because if you fade away, this country fades away. So thanks for what you do. Thanks for the leadership. Thanks for your trust and, and the ability to talk to you. I hope you have an awesome four days with your reunion, you know, and that you're able to catch up, and more importantly, I can't wait to see what you do to lead my three boys and the rest of this nation back to better days because you're the last best chance we've got. God bless you guys. God bless America. Thank you.